experiment one, data and error analysis. So in this experiment, it's actually not so much of an experiment than an exercise. The first thing that we do is we calculate significant figures. Now there's an entire session on significant figures. In your lessons, if you look at the PowerPoints, or you look at the PowerPoint in uh, the first chapter. In any case, this is really simple and straightforward, part A and part B. You have four significant figures and five significant figures in each of these numbers right here. Your job here is to change that to three significant figures. So for instance, 1.17, I'm at the third significant figure. I'm going to get rid of the two, it's less than five, so I don't round up the figure next to it. 2586, I keep the first three, use a six, I round up eight to nine, so this becomes 2,590. A big mistake that a lot of people make is you just cut off the six and change this to 259. That's not anywhere near this value. You put a zero there as a placeholder and it becomes 2590. And do the rest for the next three. Three significant figures. While in part A, you're going to keep everything in decimal form, part B, you change it to scientific notation. So for instance, you want this in three significant figures, but you're going to move the decimal point around and then multiply by it a power of 10. So here I move the decimal place 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 until my number is between 1 and less than 10. So that gives me 1.0. I'd move the decimal point 6 places to the left. So that becomes 1.00, there are my three significant figures, times 10 to the 6th power. This is the opposite. To get between 1 and 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I move the decimal place 7 points to the right, places to the right. It becomes 1.11, get rid of that last one right there, 1.11 times 10 to the minus 7. Do the same with the others, and again, if you need to use a reference here, you can go to chapter one, where we talk about significant figures, and tell us about how to handle these. Now, in part one, B and C, we're going to take actual measurements that we've used. In this case, we're measuring the volume of a box. In this case, we're looking at the circumference and diameter of a cylindrical body. And we're going to use these figures to actually calculate something, multiplying and dividing, and come out with the correct significant figures. So the idea here is, can you multiply and divide and still keep the right significant figures? In the first part, we have 10.5, 5.25, and 3.12 centimeters as the dimensions of the box. The volume is the product of all three. So you each have three significant figures, that becomes the least accurate of all my figures. My answer is also going to have three significant figures. In this bottom case, we're looking at the circumference around a disk or cylindrical body. We know the circumference is equal to 2 pi r, where 2 times r is the diameter. So if we want to calculate pi experimentally, we can take the circumference and divide it by twice the radius, or we're dividing by the diameter. So our circumference is measured to be 17.25 centimeters. That's four significant figures. Our diameter is measured to be 5.49 centimeters. That's three significant figures. So the limiting factor here is the three significant figures, which is in the diameter. So circumference divided by diameter, put the answer in three significant figures. Okay, now we're going to calculate experimental error. Experimental error is a way of calculating how close your experimental measurements were to what the actual measurements should be. We can only do this when we have an accepted value. Pi is easy. In the previous case, you did a calculation for pi. Here we have the accepted value. Okay, let's calculate the fractional error in this particular case. We take our experimental value, Subtract off the accepted value, 
That gives us a difference. Take the absolute value. We don't care about plus or minus. And then divide by the accepted. So fractional error is really the same thing as percent error. We just don't have the 100% multiplied at the end. Percent error, well, I just told you what it is. Again, experimental value minus the accepted value. Take the difference. Take the absolute value. Divide by the accepted. Multiply by 100. So for instance, if I got a fractional error of 0 0.10, multiplying that by 100%, that would be a 10% percent error. So take your previous measurement from 1D, your measurement for pi, and then try to find out what the fractional and percentage error are. In B, we are going to compare two measurements of gravity. We know that on the surface of the Earth, gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. In this experimental case, there was a little bit of error. So our first measurement was 9.85, that's a little bit on the high side. The next measurement was on the low side, 9.70. And you could want to compare that to the accepted value of 9.8. Okay. Now, it asks you to calculate the mean. The mean's easy. You just take the sum of all the individual measurements, divide by the number of measurements. That's your mean. So this plus this divided by 2. We want you to calculate the percent difference between the two experimental values. And this is a measurement that roughly gives you the precision. How closely do your values agree? Take the difference between them and then divide by the mean. Multiply by 100% to convert to a percentage. Last, we want to calculate the percent error for each measurement. Calculate the percent error for G1, percent error for G2. Comparing it to the accepted value, and then calculate the percent error for the mean. Oh, jumped ahead a little bit. Okay, you think that you're almost done. Part 2C is actually probably more than half of the entire experiment. So um, after you've done B, you're going to go to C, and here you're actually going to do. Uh, some error analysis for a larger set of data. Now what I recommend that you do for this is that you do this on a spreadsheet. You should all know how to use Microsoft Excel. Try to learn how to use it if, if you don't know how to use it. But take the data table that they've given you and expand it with more columns. So what they want you to do is um, complete the table showing the average distance of fall, so we're going to need a, an average column. Here are all your distances, you want an average column there. You're going to calculate the standard deviation, which requires quite a few columns. And you're going to also want a column for t squared. Okay? You don't have to do it exactly the way that I did it. I found that doing it this way, it, you know, it keeps things organized. It seems to be a logical way to organize the data. Okay, so the first thing is, I want to add a t-squared. I've got my time right here, okay? These are the, the different measurements at different times that were made. And you can see we did this one, two, three, four, five different times, okay? So here I've added a time squared. That's really easy in Excel. What you do is you make this, cup, this cell equal to this cell raised to the second power, you can use a little caret 2, or you can just simply say this cell is equal to this cell times itself. Okay? And then, if you know anything about Excel, if you don't want to have to do repetitious things, you can highlight this and just do a fill down. It'll do the calculations for everything. Okay, so I have my time squared. Now I want to do my average column. So I'm going to insert a little average right here. This seems more complicated than it actually is. This says that the mean is equal to 1 over the number of measurements made, there are 5 measurements made, times the sum of all the individual measurements. So, in this cell right here, I can say this is equal to the sum of all these, or I can add them out, this cell plus this cell plus this cell plus this cell plus this cell, put in parentheses, and then divide by the number 
the number of measurements is five. And again, I did it for the first two. The average of zeros is always going to be zero. Um, here I did the measurement uh, for this one. And notice I kept three significant figures. It's probably wise, even though all of these have two significant figures. After you have your column of time squared in, your average measurement of y, how far it's fallen, in a given amount of time, you want to create, well, at least I found this helpful, another whole set of measurements, which are the deviations, okay, for each of these. We'll try one, two, three, four, five, which are really times. The deviation of each individual measurement compared to the mean, okay? So what am I saying here? So each of these cells, you got uh, one, two, three, four, five down, one, two, three, four, five across, you're going to have 25 new cells, which you take the, the difference between that measured value and the average value. So for instance, this cell is equal to this cell minus the mean. This cell is equal to this cell minus the mean. This cell is equal to this cell minus the mean. Keep filling this out until you have this done. So you'll get five measurements for each of the times. The first row, of course, is easy because there's no deviation from the mean. Everything's zero. And again, I've just put in little slashes here because I want you to do the work. You know, fill out this whole table. Okay. Now we're ready to actually um, square all those deviations. Uh, and then we can do standard deviation. Okay, these are all the, the differences. Standard deviation involves the sum of the square of the differences divided by n minus 1. So now I've got to take each of these values and square them. That's easy. This cell is just equal to this cell times itself, or this cell raised to the second power. So I do this one, this one, this one, this one, and notice I have another set of five columns right here. Okay? So my chart is getting bigger and bigger. Finally, standard deviation. Again, the notation looks a little bit, I forgot the square root when I talked about standard deviation. The, the you know, symbols look a little more intimidating than they are. This means that the standard deviation for each time, the standard deviation for each time, the standard deviation for each time is 1 divided by the number of measurements minus 1. So it's 1 over 4. 1 over 4 right here. Times the sum of all the squares, not the sum of the deviations and then squaring that, the sum of each square. So this one plus this one plus this one plus this one plus this one. To do this, this cell right here is 1 quarter times the sum of all these, square root, okay? And that'll give you the standard deviation. So you should have a standard deviation for each time right there, okay? Looks like a big chart. Again, I suggest that you do this on Excel. If you're used to using the Google equivalent, it works well on that. There are a number of different spreadsheets that you can do this for. But really, the spreadsheets are a powerful tool where we can process a lot of data very, very quickly without having to do the same calculation over and over again. Um, so learn how to use a spreadsheet. Very, very important if you don't know how to use it. Okay, next part. Plot the data from part C as the average distance of fall, that's this column right here, this average column that we put in, as a function of time. This is a function of this right here. Remember that t equals zero is a known point. Find the best fit to the data. Well, this data should produce a parabolic uh, shape to it. We'll explain more why this happens when we do experiment three. But here we're just we're plotting 
average distance as a function of time. And again, you know, some of the data points will be high, some of the data points will be low, but um, for each given time, you should have a data point here. Make sure you make your distances and make sure you make your uh, times scale to the data that you have. Here I have it going from zero to about 1.25 because my last value right here is 1.25. Label your graphs. This is graph one, distance versus time. I have this quantity labeled over here. What it is, what are the units, what it is, what are the units. Okay? That is the information you should have on a graph. The next one, you want to graph the average distance now as a function of time squared. That's why we put that extra column in. When we do that, we linearize the data. This is a common technique we do to analyze things. Remember, this first graph was a curve. It's very difficult to fit a curve, okay, if you're just doing it by hand. If we do it instead, you, know, you, you can actually do it with a spreadsheet because they'll ask, you know, what polynomial do you want to fit to? And this is actually, you know, a second order polynomial. But with this one right here, we are basically graphing this as a function of this, making it linear because y, okay, is a function of t squared rather than t. Anytime you have a linear relationship, and this is a constant right here, one half the acceleration of gravity, anytime you have a linear relationship between two quantities, we expect to get a line. So we graph this, okay, and again, the data points will start close down here. Remember, zero, zero is a, is a um, absolute point. You keep putting more and more data points there and then fit a line to that. Okay? If you're using Excel, you can say add a trend line. It'll give you the slope. If you're just doing this by hand, you can add the rise over run on yourself and calculate what that is. Now remember, the equation says that y is equal, equals one-half gt squared. So the slope of this graph is one-half g. We're trying to find g from the slope. If the linear, the general equation for a linear equation is y equals mx plus b, b is zero here, x is your t squared, it's on the x-axis, m is your slope, it's one-half g, okay? Where Again, the slope is the rise of a run. So your slope is equal to 1 half g. Your experimental value for g will be twice the slope. So if your slope is 5, your experimental value of g is twice that. It would be 10. All right? Compare this to the accepted value of 9.8. So again, we're going to do a percent error. And that's basically the lab. Okay? We get accepted 9.8. So if you got like 10, now you're getting pretty close. Do a percent error, multiply that by 100%. Again, if you get like 4.9, you probably forgot to multiply it by, by 2. Or 5, you forgot to multiply it by 2. Okay, good luck.